Topic is calculus and its predisposing factors. Now we know that dental plaque is a soft deposit. Once it gets mineralized, it becomes your calculus, right? Let's see. Now, why is it that it's important to know about calculus? Once a, one's debris or one's uh, soft deposit gets calcified or mineralized, it becomes very difficult to remove it until and unless you go to a dentist and get it removed, right? So that's why oral hygiene or be it just oral hygiene or any personal hygiene becomes very important. So you need to maintain your hygiene. Let's go in detail about your dental calculus. So what is dental calculus? By definition, it is a adherent calcified or calcifying mass that forms on the surface of the teeth and dental processes. So it can be on the teeth surfaces or even your dental appliances. And you should always remember your dental calculus is always covered by, an, by on the external surface by a vital, tightly adherence, unmineralized plaque. So your dental calculus is just a mineralized form of plaque. And then this calculus is always covered on the external surface by your layer of unmineralized plaque, which is more vital and tightly adherent. Next comes your types of dental calculus. Depending on the location with respect to your gingival margin, you have your supragingival calculus and you have your subgingival calculus. You can also classify calculus depending on the source where it is derived from. Whether it is derived from saliva, then it will become your salivary calculus and then it will become, if it is derived from your GCF or it becomes your subgingival or uh, your seduminal calculus. Now this supragingival calculus is also called as your salivary calculus because the source for its derivative is mainly your supra, uh, saliva. So supragingival calculus is basically a tightly adherent calcified deposit that is seen or that is formed on the clinical crowns of the teeth coronal to your marginal gingiva. Okay? It's above your free gingival margin. So if you can see the photographs, all that is present in the photographs is the yellowish one is your supragingival calculus. And the source for this calculus is mainly derived from your saliva and therefore it is also called as your salivary calculus. Now comes your subgingival calculus. And this subgingival calculus is also called as cerebral calculus because the source for it is derived from your gingival cravicular fluid. And the location of this calculus is present below the uh, uh, gingival margin. When you say uh, sometimes your subgingival calculus gets exposed to the oral environment, maybe probably the patient is having recession. The patient is having gingival recession. What will happen is the, cal uh, the calculus gets exposed to the oral cavity. And this can be re-termed as your supragingival calculus. So the thing what you're seeing here is your subgingival calculus, which is been treated and you can see the excellent re results. Now let's see or let's compare the supragingival with that of your subgingival calculus and then according to the color, consistency, size, shape and things like that. So first is your color. When you see a supragingival calculus, it is more yellowish, it's white, sometimes creamish gray and it can be stained or the color can alter depending on the pigments, either the tobacco or the food or any other pigment. And the subgingival calculus, the color of the subgingival calculus is mainly light to dark brown. That is mainly because of the source from where it is derived from. Mostly the source is because of your blood pigments. And then your size. And you see the size of the supragingival calculus, it's more bulky in nature, okay, but it is not very strong. It's very bulky, but it's not that strong and it's more amorphous, okay, and it is, you can actually visualize these deposits. So it is grossly seen. Now, sometimes the supragingival calculus can form interproximal bridges between the adjacent teeth. So means, if suppose there is a calculus on, suppose on the lingual surface of your mandibular incisor, probably 4-1. And then your, your 3 one also has the supragingival calculus. Now both these can link together. They form an interproximal bridge. And then it is seen a, that is one of the typical feature of your supragingival calculus. Sometimes it can even extend over the gingival margin if the calculus is too much. Okay. And leading to an erythematous or inflammatory reaction in your gingiva just underneath the calculus which is covering or which is uh, over your marginal gingiva. What is the size of your subgingival uh, calculus? 
it is basically flat because it follows the contour of your gingival sulcus or your periodontal pocket now your periodontal pocket is just contoured just like towards the contour of your alveolar bone or your root surface right so your calculus also becomes flat and it takes the contour of your uh, pocket periodontal pocket or your gingival sulcus basically because of the pressure from your periodontal pocket the pocket wall now let's see the consistency and surface te texture how it differs between supra and subgingival calculus your supra gingival calculus it's moderately hard okay it is new the, but most of the newer deposits are less harder okay if you see a subgingival calculus it is flint like and it is very hard it's difficult to remove your subgingival calculus when compared to your supra gingival calculus okay and your new deposits of your subgingival calculus again because it's a new deposit they'll be little less mineralized when compared to the older deposits therefore they are less denser and harder now supra gingival calculus looks more porous the surface is more porous which is covered by a non mineralized biofilm whereas your sub subgingival again the surface is again covered by your non mineralized or dental biofilm how is it distributed on the individual teeth your supra gingival calculus definitely as the name determines it is above or it is coronal to your gingival margin whereas your subgingival calculus is apical to your gingival margin and then with with gingival recession your supra your subgingival calculus will become your supra gingival calculus you can cover it by your uh, means it gets exposed to oral environment so it will it is seen visibly therefore it is supra gingival calculus sometimes the subgingival can be covered by a layer of supra gingival calculus when you see the quantity your supra gingival calculus is directly related to four points what are the first depending on the personal oral hygiene if the patient is able to maintain good hygiene then there is decreased production of supra gingival calculus if he is not able to maintain the production increases so it is directly related to the patient's oral care procedures second use of tobacco the more he uses tobacco the more formation of dental plaque calculus and then this calculus further can get stained okay physical characteristics of the diet again if it is a fibrous food then there is better self cleansing mechanism if it is a sticky food then it accumulates more and more amount of plaque and then that gets calcified over a period of time and then it is also directly related to your individual tendencies means one person might be highly prone to develop calculus whereas the other person might be a light calculus former so that is the difference whereas your subgingival calculus it's mainly dependent on your pocket depth increase in pocket depth increase in the formation of subgingival calculus then it is also increased with age now why they say it is increased with age is because mainly because of the poor or old hygiene maintenance with as the age advances you might not concentrate too much on sitting and brushing right so maybe that can be a reason for your increase with age so increase with age decrease Uh, uh maintenance or oral hygiene maintenance so decrease um, uh, increase amount of plaque accumulation increase uh, exposure to uh, formation of periodontal pockets therefore they can be increased subgingival calculus apart from that again individual tendencies some are more prone for periodontal disease some are more prone for subgingival calculus when compared to the others it's also related to the development and progression of periodontal diseases the rapid the progression the or more the uh, progression of the disease the more deep in, deeper the pocket is getting the more amounts of uh, your subgingival calculus is getting accumulated how is it distributed overall most of the time your supra gingival calculus has a symmetrical pattern of distribution it is more often seen on the buccal surface of your maxillary molars and the lingual surface of your mandibular incisors why is this seen like this now because your salivary gland ducts we know that your source for your formation of supra gingival calculus is mainly saliva that's why it's also called as your salivary calculus right therefore your parotid gland ducts that is your stentsens duct open exactly at your orifice the orifice opens exactly at your first molar area maxillary first molar therefore the calculus formation is more on your maxillary molars and similarly your sublingual salivary glands and your submandibular salivary gland ducts open in your exactly in your, near your lingual surface of your mandibular incisors therefore the formation of supra gingival calculus is more often seen in those areas right whereas your sub gingival calculus it is heaviest on your proximal surfaces why are they saying this because it's light on the facial see whenever we brush right we tend to concentrate more on your buccal surfaces and exactly your brush also 
cleans or cleanses your buccal and the palatal surfaces, right? But it doesn't enter your interproximal areas. So that's why you have special interdental aids. You have, they've developed interdental aids for what? Because the oral, the brush just it's by itself can't reach your interdental areas, okay? So you have your special interdental aids like your dental floss, you have your uh, uh, interdental brushes, you have unitofted brushes. All these are your interproximal or interdental aids. Now these all will help in maintaining your interproximal areas. Therefore, your subgingival calculus might be highest in your uh, more commonly occurring in your proximal surfaces when compared to your facial or lingual surfaces, right? Then, apart from that, it occurs with or without associated with suprajingeal calculus. Some patients might not have any suprajingeal calculus, but they have periodontal disease and the, they have deeper pockets, so they have lots of subgingival calculus. So, you don't have any symmetrical pattern of uh, distribution. Coming that, that finishes off your characteristics or differences between your supra and subgingival calculus. Let's see the composition. The composition of calculus mainly has an organic composition, it has an inorganic component. Apart from that, you also have some trace amounts of certain minerals like your zinc, magnesium, sodium, strontium, bromide, etc. Okay, coming, let's see first about your inorganic component. First inorganic component or the main component would be your calcium followed by your phosphorus. Calcium forms about 27 to 29 percent, whereas your phosphorus just about followed second by about 16 to 18 percent, and the rest are your carbonate, sodium, magnesium, and fluoride with the respective percentages. Okay, if you see a suprajingeal calculus, it just has a mineral content of about 37%, whereas your subgingival calculus has a mineral content of about, or your inorganic content by volume about 58%. So your subgingival calculus is more mineralized when compared to your suprajingival. Always your inorganic constituents are arranged in a crystal form. They're not amorphous. So the amorphous calcium and phosphorus, they convert themselves to your crystal forms. What are the crystal forms which are seen? Hydroxyapatite, beta tricalcium phosphate, magnesium mitlocite, octacalcium phosphate and your bluchite. With the main percentage of a crystal form being your hydroxyapatite of about 58%, 21% by your magnesium mitlocite, octacalcium phosphate forming about 12% and the least is your bluchite crystal form of about just 9%. Now, how is this uh, crystal form seen differ in your supra and subgingival? Your suprajingeal uh, calculus has more amounts of your hydroxyapatite and lesser amounts of your uh, your bruchite and viclocite. Whereas octacalcium phosphate is the next uh, predominant uh, after your hydroxyapatite. In the mandibular anterior region, your bruchite is more common, and posterior areas it's a magnesium viclocite. Whereas your subgingival calculus, your magnesium viclocite is a predominant one after your hydroxyapatite. So your hydroxyapatite content or the crystal form is similar to that of your suprajingival uh, calculus. But then magnesium viclocite uh, crystal form is a predominant in subgingival but not in your suprajingival. And it has less of bruchite and octacalcium phosphate. Okay, that finishes your inorganic content. Let's see your organic content. What all it contains? Again, definitely it will have lots of polysaccharides, it has lipids, it has proteins, it has desquamated epithelial cells, leukocytes, it has various microorganisms in the respective percentages. Okay. That finishes with the composition. Okay, now let's see how this calculus forms. Now that we know the composition of the calculus, we know the sources of calculus, let's see how this calculus is forming. So what are the st steps of, uh, basic steps of uh, calculus formation first is pedicle obviously for the calculus to form plaque has to form for the plaque to form first you have to have pellicle so first you have the pellicle formation followed by the plaque formation and then this plaque slowly gets mineralized and that becomes your calculus right so let's see this calculus formation or the mineralization process starts between your first to the 14th day of plaque formation you can see Within just about two days of plaque formation, 50% of the plaque is mineralized and 60 to 90% is mineralized just within about 12 days. You can imagine how fast the plaque is getting mineralized, right? And it reaches a peak of about just 10 weeks to 6 months. After that, there is a steady fall in calculus formation. Why is it so that it increases till 10 weeks and 6 months and it falls rapidly? That is because the bulkiness of the calculus increases. If the bulk of the calculus increases, it can't stay there for too long. It starts to break away. That
that's why you feel that it remains stationary after 10 weeks to 6 months. So this we've already discussed. Now we know what are the sources for supra gingival calculus. The mineral sources are mainly derived from saliva, whereas for subgingival it's mainly derived from GCF. We always have to remember that more the inflammation, okay, more will be the GCF flow. More the GCF flow, more will be the sources of minerals for your subgingival calculus. So there is an increased process of mineralization because of inflammation. The mechanism of mineralization. We've discussed that certain individuals are more prone for calculus formation when compared to others. So these individuals are called as heavy calculus formers and the other, other category are called as light calculus formers. Why? These heavy calculus formers, they said that they have more amounts of calcium and phosphate minerals. Whereas your light calculus formers, they have more amounts of inhibitors of calculus formation. That is your pyrophosphates. So more amounts of pyrophosphates in an individual will inhibit the formation of calculus in them. Okay. So they have used this technology even in our toothpaste. They have incorporated these pyrophosphates in the toothpaste and in order to decrease the calculus formation. And always it just forms in the form of amorphous calcium phosphate which later gets converted into your crystal forms that we discussed. That is hydroxyapatite, piclocite, brucite and octocalcium phosphates. Theories. Now, how this calculus is forming is explained by various theories. You exactly don't know. So, they've explained the just hypothesis that probably this can be a reason for why the calculus is forming. These are the theories. Precipitation theory, epitactic theory or the heterogeneous nucleation theory. And you have the third theory that is the inhibition theory. Let's go in detail about each theory. The first is the precipitation theory. According to this precipitation theory, they're saying there's a probably an increase in the pH. Okay, as a result of which your calcium and phosphate ions are getting precipitated and they are forming your calculus. Now, this precipitation theory has been explained by various mechanisms. First, they said that probably loss of carbon dioxide and increase in the production of ammonia contributes to an increase in the pH. So, the pH is becoming more alkaline because of increase in the ammonium content, right? So, as a result of which there is precipitation of calcium and phosphorus. So, that is one of the mechanism of precipitation theory. What is the second mechanism? You have lots of colloidal proteins, right, in the saliva. So these colloidal proteins will bind with your calcium and phosphate ions, okay, and they form one supersaturated solution. Now, when you have a supersaturated solution, that what does it mean? It means to say that the solution is excessively saturated with these calcium and phosphate ions, as a result of which your colloidal proteins will settle down and then it will precipitate your calcium phosphate salts, okay. The, what is the third theory which explains the precipitation theory? They said certain enzymes. Now, these enzymes can be phosphatases or esterases. These phosphatases and esterases, either they are derived from the bacteria, they can be derived from the source, that is your leukocytes, or any epithelial cells or desquamated epithelial cells release these enzymes. As a result of this, if you have phosphatase which is released by the microorganisms or the host cell, what it will do? It will cause hydrolyzing of organic phosphate. Now, you know that phosphate is not found in a free form. It's always bound to one compound, right? Now, this phosphatase, what it will do? It will break the bond between the, in that organic phosphate and it will try to extract out your free phosphate ions, right? So, as a result of the extraction of these free phosphate, you have freely available increased amounts of free phosphate ions in saliva. So, this will combine with your calcium and then it will start to precipitate to form your calcium phosphate salts, okay? The other enzyme that is your esterase. Now, there's another enzyme which is the esterase. Now, this esterase again is released by various bacteria and your uh, other uh, host cells. Now, what this esterase will do, it will break down uh, the fatty acids to free fatty acids. Now, once these free fatty acids are available, they jo join or they combine with your calcium and phosphate ions and they form soaps. Okay. Now, this soaps again. Once it gets super saturated, they start to settle down and release or uh, precipitate your calcium and phosphate ions. That is the function of your esterases. And that completes your precipitation theory. So, this basically saying that your minerals are precipitating and therefore your calculus is forming. So, various mechanisms for this precipitation, either an increase in ammonium content because of loss of carbon dioxide, there is increase in pH, so there is precipitation. The second one is because of uh, your uh, enzymes like your phosphatases and esterases and the third one is maybe because of your 
colloidal proteins which are forming a super saturated solution with your calcium phosphate salts and then the colloidal proteins settle down and precipitate your calcium phosphate leading to calculus formation. The second theory is your epitactic theory. It's also called as your heterogeneous nucleation theory. According to this theory, they say that there are certain seeding agents like you sow a seed and it will grow to a plant. Right. Similarly, you, there are certain seeding agents which are responsible for the formation or mineralization of plaque or forming calculus. Now, what are these seeding agents? It can be your intercellular matrix of plaque, okay, or it can be just your carbohydrates or any protein complexes, or else your plaque bacteria itself. So these seed, these agents can act as seeds, and these seeds will start your mineralization process. So they will start slowly when small small foci of mineral deposits are formed. Now these all these foci will join together or coalesce together and they form your calculus. That is your epitactic theory or the heterogeneous nucleation theory. The last theory is your inhibition theory. According to this theory, they say that not all individuals are prone for calculus formation. The cal calcification occurs only at typical sites. That is because of the increased content of the calculus inhibitory agents that is your pyrophosphates. Okay. Next one is now that you're finished with how the calculus forms, what is it is composed of, you know, and then we already uh, we also spoke about the uh, the classification of calculus, and then we spoke about the characteristics of each supra and subgingival calculus. What are the sources? What are the theories? What are the formation methods? What is heavy calculus former and who is a uh, light calculus former? We should know how to detect this calculus. Right? As a dentist, you should know how to detect calculus. If you're not able to identify that there is calculus and you don't know the methods of detection, then you're gone, right? You're not serving your patient well. So what are the methods of detection? The various methods, either you have the clinical methods, that is your exploratory method, transillumination methods, okay, or else use of compressed air, or you can use some tactile and non-auditory perception, or else even your radiographs can be used, or else your advanced methods of detection can be used. Let's go in detail about each one. If you're using an exploratory method, basically you're using an explorer, you can see in the picture, an explorer is being used. In the second picture, which is highlighted with the red, you can see that your explorer is being used in order to detect your calculus. This is, do you have a specific explorer? It's called as your Shepherd's Hook Explorer, which is a number 23 end. Okay, it is used to detect your calculus. Coming to radiographs. Now these radiographs, they say that, yeah, they can detect your calculus because definitely calculus is a mineralized deposit. So you can see it in a radiograph, but they are not that sensitive. You can't say that by determining, suppose you, you have your tooth surface here and the calculus is present here. Okay, and then you can't say that, yeah, this is the depth of the pocket because your calculus is here till it's ending till here from here till here you have calculus okay this entire area you have calculus you can't just say that your your pocket is still this depth yes because your calculus is there because always the apical portion of the periodontal pocket is unmineralized okay the apical portion is unmineralized so you can't determine the depth of a periodontal pocket just by seeing the depth of or the uh, uh, the length of your calculus right and moreover it's not a very sensitive method The other method is your use of compressed air. So you just pass some air into the gingival margin. You can, the gingival margin, it's a free gingiva, right? It's unattached. So it will slightly move away from the tooth surface. And the next one is your transillumination. What do you do here? You know your enamel is translucent, right? If you pass some light, it will reflect. But if you have calculus present there, it is opaque. It won't allow the light to reflect. So that is one of the method of detection of calculus. The last one would be your tactile and auditory these are the simple methods okay usually rough cementum or the calculus is scratchy or it is noisy in uh, nature so you the auditory perception would be it's noisy when you're trying to debride the area suppose you take a scale uh, your curette okay and then you go beyond the subgingival area and you try to root plane the surface what happens is you can cure that typical noise that is mainly because of the scratchy noise of your calculus okay what are the advanced technologies? You have detection systems, you have detection and removal systems. So there is the second category is a combined system of calculus detection plus your calculus removal. The detection systems, these are the latest technologies. Five, they, uses, they use fiber optic technology, which is your perioscopy, 
okay and then you have your spectro optical technology that is your detector and then you have your auto fluorescence technology which is a diagnodent this is the diagnodent they emit some fluorescent light okay that is used for detection of calculus and then you have your ultrasound technology that is your perio scan so this is an example basically they use an ultrasound technology and then you have your calculus detection along with your removal system which uses your laser and your auto fluorescence that is your key laser 3 this is the picture of key laser 3 the commercially available device this is a it combines your detection as well as your treatment which is very expensive okay that finishes your detection of calculus that is diagnosis of calculus now what are the factors which influence calculus formation there are certain factors which influence this formation of calculus first would be your age then carbohydrates that is your diet whether you are on sticky food fibrous food etc and then you have your pep proteins acid peptides okay calcium phosphate ratio increase in calcium phosphate ratio increase prone for mineralization also your potassium ion concentration ph of saliva okay salivary enzymes viscosity of saliva if there is viscous saliva then the the flushing effect of saliva is decreased right so self cleansing mechanism is gone so there is more amount of plaque accumulation and formation of calculus similar to your salivary flow if the patient is having xerostomia then there is no self cleansing mechanism because of your flushing effect lost because of the lack of salivary flow Now, why is this calculus important? So much we are talking about calculus, composition, structure, that mineralization, etc., etc. Theories. Why is it important? What is the pathogenic role in periodontal diseases? Now, earlier, before uh, much even your uh, plaque was, uh, you know, came into picture, they said that it is a calculus which is a main culprit for causing periodontal disease. Okay. Later, as the research went on, they said it's not the calculus, but it is a plaque. which is a culprit for causing periodontal diseases they said your calculus is just a secondary role meaning your plaque forms calculus and then over the calculus again there is a formation of plaque because your calculus is a more roughened surface right there is more formation of plaque and then again that gets mineralized again there is plaque formation and this process continues so basically your calculus acts as a nidus for uh, plaque accumulation okay that is a pathogenic role of calculus in periodontal disease now how is the calculus uh, deposits what are they now they can bring the bacterial deposits more closely to your supporting this is the potential role they bring the bacteria more in close uh, proximity to your soft tissues right they interfere with the self cleansing obviously they get calcified over a period of time you can't clean the calcified deposit okay and then third one is they prevent the patient from performing proper oral hygiene then attachment of the calculus how is this attached to the tooth surface there are four means of attachment the first mean of attachment is just by your org organic pellicle that you know pellicle is there plaque is there and calculus is forming what is the second method mechanical interlocking into the surface irregularities you have some surface irregularities on the tooth like resorption lacunae and all so your calculus goes and attaches in or mechanically interlocks with the resorption lacunae and sits there to firmly adhere it the third method of attachment would be the penetration of the calculus bacteria into the cementum and the fourth method is a close adaptation of the calculus into under surface depressions okay what are the other local contributing factors now we finish with calculus what are the contributing factors what does this mean It means to say that there are some certain factors which contribute to the formation of plaque and thus contributing to formation of calculus and then contributing to your gingival and periodontal diseases you can classify them as iatrogenic factors or you can classify them as periodontal therapy associated with orthodontic therapy malocclusion habits and self inflicted injuries extraction of impacted third molars tobacco use and radiation therapy iatrogenic means dentist induced either they're giving some faulty restorative margins they're giving some overhanging margins if you can see the radiograph the filling is been overfilled and it's not contoured properly so what will happen that area acts as a nidus for plaque accumulation and it becomes difficult to maintain that area so there is a constant irritation to the soft tissue and then it progresses to your alveolar bone leading to alveolar bone loss right then similarly your restorative margins either over contoured crowns under contoured crowns either you're giving equi gingival margins supra gingival margins or sub gingival margins by your your hampering your 
biologic width okay then design of partial dentures suppose you're doing a removal partial denture and then you give a clasp right it's a retentive you want to retain the denture so you give a clasp on your canines so what happens exactly in that area patient is not maintaining and there's a lot of trauma friction over there there's accumulation of plaque over a period of time this plaque will cause inflammation of the gingiva so the gingiva will become receded or it will lead to gingival recession loss of alveolar bone gingival recession and then even that area will accumulate more amount of plaque and then you can also lead to root caries right one fine day you can even remove the tooth because it's so grossly decayed then open contacts now you do a filling okay you, you do a class 2 filling class 2 restoration amalgam restoration if you don't give a proper uh, proximal contact between the two teeth and you're leaving a gap like this okay you have not contoured it so what will happen your upper tooth will constantly act as a plunger cusp forcefully wedging the food into this area okay your upper, upper cusp is going to forcefully wedge the food into this open contact area so over a period of time these two teeth are going to have periodontal problems they're going to lose all the alveolar bone and lead to vertical ang or angular bony defects then restorative dentistry procedures you're doing using a rubber dam so when you have to place a rubber dam you use a rub clamp right you ru use a rubber dam clamp so what do you do when you have to place a clamp you try to impinge it too much into the sulcus so there you're hampering your gingival tissues okay then what is the th second point that is periodontal therapy associated with orthodontic therapy now you have done an orthodontic treatment right so uh, what do you do you are giving certain orthodontic forces if you're going to give excessive forces what is going to happen normally in the areas of tension there's always deposition of bone and in the areas of pressure there's always resorption of bone if there is excessive orthodontic forces what will happen there is excessive resorption of alveolar bone on the pressure side okay leading to alveolar bone loss okay and the one fine day the tooth will start moving it will become loose or it will become mobile and it will lose its function or it will shed off right and apart from that suppose you have done uh, an orthodontic treatment the patient is undergoing an orthodontic treatment and then you have given him elastics okay to close the diastema you have given him an elastic orthodontic elastics now that elastic has entered deep into the sulcus how do you remove it don't you think that acts as a foreign body so you have to remove that right so what do you do you have to take the help of a periodontal surgeon or a periodontist expose the flap and remove that elastic okay in the meanwhile there has been lot of destruction that has already started and happened okay then third point is malocclusion how does malocclusion contribute to periodontal disease how does it act as a contributing factor simple if you know you have malocclusion suppose you're crowding what will happen patient won't be able to maintain oral hygiene there will be lot of deposition of plaque over a period of time so that's going to definitely cause problems in future maybe starting with gingivitis and then it can go to periodontitis right apart from that it can also cause trauma from occlusion suppose a patient has a deep bite what will happen is a constant pressure on the periodontium so periodontium will take in all the pressure till whatever time it can take in if it can't take in it gives away so it will start losing the periodontium and leading to periodontal bone loss then you have habits and self inflicted injuries okay now what habits it can be any uh, mouth breathing tongue thrusting okay all these kind of habits can cause your gingival inflammation suppose your mouth breathing you have you are a mouth breather what will happen there is a constant Uh, irritation or the dryness of the gingiva because your anterior gingiva is constantly exposed to your oral environment because of a because you're a mouth breather so what will happen over a period of time it gets dried off and then lead to gingival inflammation gingival inflammation more amount of plaque accumulation more amount of plaque accumulation calculus formation again plaque accumulation leading to periodontal problems okay then you have something called as extraction of impacted third molars now the patient has gone for an extraction of a third molar okay now what do you do that once you extract you have to make sure that you approximate the distal portion of your second molar the flap in that area you have to approximate it properly if you don't approximate then the, you develop something called as a distal pocket that is exactly to the distal to your last molar okay there is a pocket which is developed so there is 
your bone uh, bo there will be severe bone loss and there is a pocket which is developed so how do you treat it so you should be careful and that again acts as a source of accumulation of more deposits and plaque tobacco use so you know smoking is directly related to periodontal disease right increase amounts of cigarettes the patient is smoking he is more prevalent for periodontal problems right and then radiation therapy how does radiation therapy link with the contributing etiological factors now patient who is undergoing radiation therapy usually has something called as mucositis he has certain side effects right he has either inflammation of the entire mucosa or he can have xerostomia or viscous saliva so all these will affect the self cleansing properties of the person and will lead to further detrimental effects on your